computer and uh, we are recording okay i've got to make my little screen go away here okay so i am tom Pereira, and i'm a retired professor of neuroscience i taught at columbia university and at montclair state university and finally retired about in 2002 and my research was all on the electrical activity of the brain and coding in the brain and as you probably know i've now sort of uh, gone on to collecting and restoring and selling enigma machines so that's me and i'm going to take you on a trip through uh, phil weingarten's rather extraordinary uh, work uh, we'll start out uh, with uh, uh, this view, let's see if I can get this to work, I'm hoping. Uh, this view of Phil Weingarten in front of some of the radios that he collected. You'll notice that Phil uh, was born in 1914. He died in 1998. And this talk is going to talk about not only the beginnings of his work, but also in detail about how he made extremely convincing and accurate copies of various radio tubes and various radios and various telegraph keys. Um, the information in this talk came from a lot of people, many of whom were taken by Phil and uh, ended up giving him huge amounts of money for things that they later found were fakes. And I actually had some people come to me after, the time, uh, after I gave this talk at the Antique Wireless Association in 2007 and say, could you take a look at this and tell me if it's a fake? And it turned out that a good number of them were fake. So these were not happy people. Um, Phil's father is under the yellow arrow in this picture. He was being trained as a World War I wireless operator. You can see the um, the wonderful wireless apparatus over here on the table. And uh, this apparatus was quite complex. It was a uh, spark, um, a spark transmitter. And uh, uh, Phil, uh, Phil's father learned about this. And of course, Phil became uh, an interested follower of radio. In 1945, Phil was in his late 20s and Radio Row was an extraordinary place. I was actually there in 1945. I was a little seven-year-old kid at this point, and I would go down there and just pig out on all these wonderful radios that they would have on display. The prices were very reasonable, but the best thing was that they had junk radios. Notice down here that they're selling used batteries for use in these radios. And uh, over here, you can see some of the chassis, some of the parts, it's sort of like an outdoor uh, farmer's market for electronics, absolutely heaven for a person just getting started in radio. Here's my favorite pile. Uh, you could have any one of these radio sets for 25 cents. And if you were real nice to the guy, he'd sometimes give you three for 50 cents. And you could take those things home and take them apart. I used to take them apart and uh, build my junk box. We all have junk boxes. Well, mine started out in 1945 at the age of seven, and it's, uh, it's too big at this point. <laughs> Kept adding to it, but I didn't use much out of it. So that's the way Radio Row looked in those days, and that's what Phil Weingarten was uh, involved in. He was down there, and he was actually uh, setting up a store where he would sell these kinds of things. His store was on the north side of uh, Canal Street, and uh, his store was um, uh, hard to get to. You had to go down a flight of stairs, and uh, you had to sort of walk along a little corridor, and there would be Phil with this incredible huge room full of junk. And uh, he had a whole bunch of tables out in the middle of the store and uh, along the wall behind glass where you couldn't touch them, he had his really neat radio equipment. Um, his initial test bench looked like this. You can see some familiar stuff, a Dumont scope over here and uh, various things, including tube testers and other equipment. He was quite an extraordinarily good serviceman. 
And uh, he also ended up being quite a collector. He started out collecting radios, as you can see here. This is his, um, a, a picture of his early collection. And then as time went on, he started adding radios. This is a picture from the Old Timers Bulletin, which is the um, magazine of the Antique Wireless Association for 1968. And you can see that he's added quite a bit to his uh, radio equipment and uh, to his museum. Um, here is a picture of Phil at about that time showing his junk box. He had organized things very nicely and uh, you can see that he had access to just about any part that he wanted for fixing radios. And uh, he also decided it would be a good idea to have several different business names. So he was the Forest Hills Wireless Museum, the Marconi Museum of Wireless Telegraphy, Radio Tube Repair Laboratories. He was a member of the military affiliate radio station and so on. Um, he made very impressive letterheads and he was using these as late as 1996 to sell things, uh, typically uh, counterfeit things. This is his, uh, the header of his, uh, his, his stationery in 1996, both of those. And he used them sort of interchangeably depending on who he wanted to impress and who he wanted to sell things to. He was also made a member of the Antique Wireless Association in 1964, and he was kicked out of the wireless, Antique Wireless Association somewhat after that. And we'll talk about that as we look at his counterfeit. During the time that he was collecting, he amassed what I would say is the finest collection of radio wireless equipment that I've ever seen. It far exceeded what the Smithsonian had uh, to offer. And I'm gonna take you on a quick tour through his um, museum, as he called it. Nobody ever got to see this museum because he was too paranoid to let people in. But he, he built the museum, he called it a museum. He loved it when people gave him um, radios for his museum. And uh, if he saw a radio that he really wanted, he would say, oh, come on, you don't want to charge me that, it's a museum. And so he ended up getting some extraordinary radios. Take a look at these radios, if you will, in his, uh, in his house in Forest Hills in Queens. They just go on and on and on with the juiciest, absolutely juiciest radios you could imagine. Um, these pictures were taken by a member of the AWA who responded to my ad asking for information about Phil Weingarten's collection and about Phil Weingarten. So you can see just beautiful, beautiful stuff. You can see a deforest Audion up there and uh, this very strange looking uh, unit and um, down here a Marconi uh, uh, set and uh, down here, very unusual typewriter that sends Morse code mechanically, very unusual setup. And uh, a lot of telegraph equipment, he realized early the value of telegraph equipment and collected some extraordinary pieces. And that's one of the reasons that he started making fake telegraph equipment. He was also very into early tubes, extremely early tubes. And he found that there was a tremendous market for those. And so when he started uh, collecting these tubes and uh, eventually he ended up making the tubes. This is a picture of Phil on the right and Joel Kossoff as a member of the AWA and sent me this picture because he'd been <coughs> one of the very few people who had been allowed to see Phil's wireless museum. Look at the ad that Phil put in the old timer bulletin of the AWA want Marconi receivers in any condition have Fleming valves, deforest spherical audience. He didn't mention that they were fake. Wireless specialty apparatus sets, Paragon, Greeby, etc., or will pay top price for Marconi receivers. And there he is. And uh, the AWA was at that point um, mentioning that uh, a, a questionable radio collector dealer in New York City who uses different names and addresses. Several members have been taken by this shady character. He's no longer an AWA, AWA member, although he appears to have access to the AWA bulletin want ads. Okay, so here we move on and we start <coughs> looking at 
the counterfeit tubes that he made. He made these counterfeit tubes in order to actually have something to put in all these radios that he had collected because many of them came without uh, tubes. And then he realized that he could sell these tubes for a huge amount of money. So he started doing that. Uh, his first tube making bench was in his kitchen. You can see the gas line over here and the Bunsen burner here. And he just fixed tubes. He didn't really make tubes with this bench. He was able to uh, undo the undo a tube, take out the uh, the grid and the plate and the filament, put a new filament in, and put it back into the shell with this apparatus because all it required was heating up the tube. He started out with the simplest of all tubes. It's known as a uh, as a Marconi coherer, and this coherer works by having two metal uh, pieces, one on either side of a little area where there are metal filings. And uh, the uh, coherer is hooked up to an antenna. And when a radio signal comes into the antenna, it causes these metal firings, filings to cohere. And that means that they actually make the circuit, a solid circuit between this connection and this connection. And uh, um, that detects the signal. The signals were all Morse code, wireless signals from spark transmitters at that point. The only problem with the Marconi coherer is that the darn metal filings stay cohered after they've cohered. So you have to have a little tapper that taps on the, the uh, coherer and breaks these little metal filings apart in order to make the thing work. Um, Phil decided this would be an easy thing to do. So here is a Phil Weingarten fake Marconi coherer. Uh, Marconi put his coherers on a piece of ivory. Phil just took a bunch of ivory keys from a piano, turned them on his lathe, uh, engraved them with patent an MWT, Marconi Wireless Telegraph symbol, and uh, put them together. Here are the components of a Phil Weingarten coherer. You can see the little metal filings in between the two metal conductors. And here is the, um, the, the ivory thing that he tied the Marconi coherer to. So that was his first thing. That was easy to do. You just had two tubes of, uh, uh, of uh, glass and you'd uh, gr grind a little hole over here and uh, bond this tube coming down here to this tube. And then you put your components in and seal them off by heating the ends. And you had to evacuate, get all the air out of the thing. He had a vacuum pump for that. And by God, you've got a Marconi coherer. The Marconi coherers he sold for about $100 back in the day, in the, in the 60s. And uh, they have now gone for as high as uh, $1,500 on eBay, even when they were listed as wine garden reproductions. It turns out that after he died, as we're going to see, his creations became incredibly more valuable than the prices he actually charged for them. I don't understand that phenomenon, but uh, we're going to talk about it. Uh, here's a picture of Phil in one of his early uh, tube making uh, shops. You'll notice over on the right a lathe. You'll notice these little things here. These are called cross fires and they are used uh, for making tubes. You can see another lathe here. There's the chuck of the lathe. There's a lot of equipment in here that you need in order to make tubes and um, Phil's work was done for Dumont Laboratories in 1948. This is just uh, three years later than we showed his laboratory initially. So he'd made a lot of progress. He was doing commercial tubes for Dumont, but he was also making his own uh, audions quite quietly. There's a crossfire. As you can see, it has a lot of tips up here and it has a number of adjustments that you can see over here. And you use that for heating the glass evenly. Uh, so you don't end up melting a spot in the glass. Here's an oxyacetylene torch that he used for part of his glass blowing. And here is an oxyhydrogen torch. And the overall laboratory uh, that he had looked like, uh, like we're going to see in a moment. These are also tools that are used for working glass. And uh, <coughs> I'd like to uh, read um, a little uh, summary uh, 
of what his laboratory consisted of, if I can find it here. I should have that out. Um, he, he had a laboratory for making tubes that um, looked like this. This is the laboratory for Phil's tube making uh, operation. And um, he had a number of things in this laboratory that helped him to make tubes. You can see up here the uh, deforest audions that he was making. Uh, there's a very, very high vacuum pump under there. And uh, there are other pieces of apparatus. I'm just going to read you because I don't know what all these things are. I'm going to read you some of the apparatus that you're seeing here. Um, Wine Garden's glass blowing setup consisted of a bench with a Litton Type F lathe on it, a two stage Senko roughing, uh, roughing vacuum pump, and a mercury diffusion pump underneath. There was also a small plating tank nearby, and a six inch Craftsman instrument machine lathe and bench press. The lathe is a Litton HSA with planetary chucks. The finger cross fires go with the Litton HSA lathe. Mr. Weingarten and I made some spherical audions, which I still have. They're pretty crude, but they actually work. The bulbs were provided by me. Uh, the filament wires were thoriated tungsten. And among the other equipment, uh, included an annealing oven, induction heater, sputtering apparatus, polariscope, dimium glass spectacles, vacuum pumps, manifolds, a Litton type D vertical sealing machine, Eisler spot welder, books on vacuum technology, assorted glass tubing, and a large assortment of glass fires. Uh, the oxygen hydrogen uh, uh, torch was used with fuchs, quartz, silica. Now, I don't know much about that, but you can be quite impressed, I think, with the work and the laboratory that he set up here. Uh, these are what some of his raw materials looked like. When he made the spherical audions, he started out with this, with the Fleming valves were sort of more linear. Uh, here's a collection of the two bases. Uh, that was found after he died, his laboratory was pretty well picked over by a lot of people. And I happened to contact one of them and I was able to buy a number of things from his laboratory. A lot of things were bought in one lot and moved out to Washington State. And uh, Jim and Felicia Cruiser bought all of the paperwork from the laboratory. So the pretty good documentation of what he was up to. Here are the spherical audion plates that he cut uh, to be mounted in the spherical audions. Here are the internal wires used in spherical audions. Here are the lead-in wires that were used to bring electricity into the spherical audions. You'll notice the date on here is March of 1945. So he was, he was preparing himself quite early for this. These are rolls of filament wire. And uh, filament wire is a special wire that uh, resists deterioration and of course requires a very, very high vacuum. Here's a sort of a display of the progress of building a, a tube. You start out by uh, fixing wires in a little glass holder, uh, add some more wires, and you then press these wires in place. This is called a press. You heat up the glass tube and squeeze it or press it, and that holds the wires in place. Here we see the filament wire, which has been put in here. And over here we see that the grid, which is the wiggly thing there, and the plate, which is the square thing in back, have been added. And this is the whole thing put together. And then you put that whole thing in an envelope to make a tube. Here are some of his drawings for his construction of these tubes. And here is a homemade Phil Weingarten Audion, DeForest Audion, which he claimed was a genuine DeForest Audion. Uh, if we look a little more closely at it, we can see the filament wire down here. Uh, mounted in three leads. We can see the grid, which is the wiggly thing here, and in the back is the plate. And here's a side view, the filament, the grid, and the plate. A different view, again, filament and grid and plate, and a view showing the plate and how it is spot welded to the red wire that comes down into the tube.
And here's how he sealed the tube. He would pump out the vacuum with this uh, point over here. And after the tube was first basically evacuated and then evacuated with the mercury pump, mercury vacuum pump, he would then seal off the glass, go into the pump, and that would seal the vacuum into the tube. Uh, here are some of his tubes, um, very good looking replicas. I don't see anything really um, very crude about them, and they worked. And this caused a tremendous number of warnings to be issued by the Antique Wireless Association. Fake audion, uh, aware, be aware of fake audions. Warning to collectors, uh, how to tell a fake deforest audion from another one. Far as we can tell, no one else made fake audions except Phil and people were really on the lookout for them after he stiffed a number of people with these extraordinarily expensive and extraordinarily fake tubes. Now, I'd like to take you for a moment to a very ethical replica tube maker, Dr. Rüdiger Walzer in Germany, and these are some of his replica tubes, and uh, here's a close-up. This is an original-looking uh, a uh, triode military French tube, but it is a replica. And he, when he made replicas, stamped the word replica into the, uh, the crimping, crimped glass area, the press as it's called. And you can read the word replica there. And to make it even easier for people to tell who had made it, he stamped the, um, the uh, date that it was made, uh, and um, uh, his letter, the letter of his name, Valza, in the middle, and the date was 2006. So it identifies this not only as a, rep a replica, but also as a tube made by him. His laboratory, Rudiger Valza's laboratory, uh, looks extraordinarily uh, like Phil's laboratory. Take a look at this and then take a look at Phil's. And we'll go back and forth a little bit. This is Rudiger Walzer's laboratory, and here's Phil's laboratory. Rudiger Walzer and Phil. So obviously Walzer took some of the information uh, from Phil and uh, used that to help him make and design his laboratory because his work was much after Phil's work. Here's another picture of Rudiger Walzer's first tube making laboratory, and you can see it has different equipment in it, and um, he, his tubes are very beautiful and very sought after by collectors as well. Now here's a story. Um, this is a, a letter from Phil on his Marconi Museum of Wireless Telegraph specialty uh, 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 stationery, and in this letter you can see that he has quoted a price of $750 plus shipping for a Marconi Fleming valve tube. And uh, he held up or he offered a letter from Gerald Tyne, a major tube expert uh, that had inspected this tube and said, Tyne says this is an original tube, which of course Tyne had not actually done. And this is the Fleming uh, valve as it appeared. And uh, it is indeed a fake made by Phil Weingarten uh, but it's a very good fake. And this was what he charged $750 for. Um, you can see well-made, nice label on ivory. And again, well-made. He put in a very impressive looking serial number on the back, something you do when you're trying to sell things. And he sealed the bottom with black uh, wax tar. And if we go back to the beginning picture here. Let me read you a letter from Jim Cruiser when uh, the man who bought this, Derek, um, um, asked about it. He, he saw my talk on Wine Garden and he asked, I wonder if I have a fake. And we say he sent pictures to, um, to um, uh, Jim Cruiser. Jim wrote, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is a prime example of a Wine Garden special. It's a classic reproduction of Phil's in which he made use of Hugo's engraving machine, which was limited in scope as to size and typeface. The ivory question mark name tag also contains much too much information for a label of its, its size, and it suspiciously overlaps the base by a considerable amount. You would never see Marconi Wireless Company apply such a label to one of their early valves. 
The black sealant on the bottom is also one of Phil's specialties. As to the bulb itself, Fleming and DeForest used platinum leads that were sealed at the arbor. They would never use copper wire as in this example. The metal binding posts on the base are also from the late teens to the 1920s, not 1907 as stated on the replica. So that's the feedback and poor Dirk um, Rohurst who bought this thing was beside himself. And he emailed me, what am I going to do? I'm stuck with this piece of junk. I don't know what to do. And I said, Dirk, would you consider coming over from Holland to the AWA meeting where I'm going to be giving a talk on Phil Weingarten and showing this, this piece of replica that you have bought from Phil? And he said, oh, yes, I really will, but I'm so upset about it. And he brought it over to the meeting of the AWA in, 19, in 2007. And I said, Dirk, you don't really want this thing anymore. Why don't you put it in the AWA auction? You paid 750 bucks for it. Maybe you'll get 100 bucks or something out of somebody who uh, wants it as a souvenir of Phil Weingart. Well, let me tell you, Dur uh, he was a very happy man as a result of the auction. Here he is. He sold that replica for $1,950 at the AWA conference in 2007, which all goes to show you that sometimes things become much more valuable after their maker or counterfeiter has passed on. Let's take a look at Phil Weingarten's counterfeit radios. He made a number of them and charged outrageous prices for them. This is a DeForest RJ9 set. I actually had a real RJ9 set that, that I brought to the uh, New England uh, uh, Antique Radio Club meet about uh, 15 years ago, and I sold it there for $8,000. And uh, I know that uh, Phil was selling them for $5,000 many years earlier. So this is a $5,000 radio with an Audion that he built in it. And he did a pretty good job on this, but he never bothered to antique the wood. And the wood looks just too new. He had a, he had a large number of DeForest Audion labels made up. And uh, we came across these labels as part of his estate, just piles of these things. And he'd stick them on yeah, the most ridiculous things, sometimes even radios that were not deforest. He also had uh, deforest uh, radio, telephone, and telegraph apparatus stamps made up. This is an original one over here. And these are some fake stamps that he had made to put on his radio. The wiring looks pretty nice on the back of this one. The Audion looks pretty good, and he got a tremendous amount of money for that set. Here's a Wallace detector that he made from scratch. And again, he made the tube, and he made the various parts. We take a look through this set. It looks very impressive. The only thing, again, is that he never bothered to antique it, and it just somehow looks a little bit on the new side, especially if you look underneath it and look at the wiring. Here's a, a picture of the, uh, the label that he put on the top, the tag. He had an engraving machine that made good looking um, uh, engraving on brass labels. And uh, here is a view of the back. And he did, he did age and uh, um, work on uh, building the patina on some of his labels. When I went to visit him, he often uh, used, he had a, a guy right around the corner from him on uh, Canal Street that sold little bottles of acid that would make any brass look old. And he would pour that stuff on these plates and uh, make them look old. And I actually bought some of that stuff uh, just to see if it worked. And it works very, very well. Anyway, there's the tube that he made. You can again see how he's pressed the filament in there. He's got the wiggly uh, uh, grid and he's got a, um, uh, a welded, uh, uh, welded on plate. A very neat job. Uh, here are some of the labels that he had for Atwater Kent. He made a lot of replica Atwater Kents, and in some cases he found junk Atwater Kents for a quarter, and he'd put labels on them and put some of his fake tubes in them and sell them for real. And not only did he sell them for real, he sold them with Atwater Kent, genuine Atwater Kent, 
um, uh, warranty tags. And here are some of the genuine, in quotes, warranty tags that we found in his estate. Um, and uh, he made people believe that they were real. This is, I think, the funniest thing he ever did. Uh, he would take radios that we saw, any old radio that you could buy on the street for 25 cents, and he would then take the panel off the front of the radio and make his own panel, and he would stamp and etch the panel with this ridiculous name. So he ended up uh, defining an entirely new radio. Nobody ever seen a Lutz radio before. And he made this panel Super DX8 manufactured by C.R. Lutz Incorporated, a type L, serial number 518. He did put down the place where he lived, however, Long Island City, which <laughs> is where this thing was made. But he ended up selling a lot of these Lutz radios to people who thought they had a really, really rare radio. And the inside was just as you expected, just a, uh, a radio that he had picked up off the street and relabeled. So that was one of his great uh, uh, coups, I think, in selling all those Lutz radios. We move on to Phil Weingarten's uh, counterfeit telegraph keys. And uh, I showed you my own uh, version of this key. This is it. Uh, and it is indeed a counterfeit key. If you look at the original key, uh, which we'll do in a moment, um, in total, uh, Phil Weingarten made uh, quite a few telegraph keys and sold them for a great deal of money. He had a machinist, machinist named Hugo, Hugo Pisciani, and Hugo allowed us to interview him after Phil had died, and he said that Phil made six Massey telegraph keys, that's what we just saw, 20 Marconi CM425 telegraph keys, and six Marconi grasshopper keys. And we'll take a look at some of these. Um, here is um, uh, Bob Merriam, who was the curator of the New England Museum of Wireless and Steam. He died very recently, um, operating a um, fill, uh, a real, I should say, Massey um, spark key with a real spark station. So this is the way the key should have looked. And uh, this is the Phil Weingarten special um, fake Massey key. Rather nicely machined. And it's very hard to tell it as different from the Massey key. If you look at the hardware on the key, look at the hardware on that and compare it with this, they're pretty close. The big difference is the name tag on the key. And I don't have the original name tag. I didn't get a picture of that. But if you look at this name tag quite closely, you can see that it was made in a sand casting system. He took an original key and made an impression in sand with it and then poured brass into the sand casting to make this. And of course, he put fake serial numbers on it and he made it look pretty good, but you can tell this as quite different from the original. The other way to tell that it is different from an original is to look at the screw that he used to hold the handle onto the frame of the key. And it's a quarter 20 cadmium plated screw, whereas it would have been a quarter 20 all brass screw with the, in the original key. Uh, the other key that he made in the highest quantities, largest quantities, was a very desirable uh, spark key, a Marconi CM425 telegraph key. And this was widely used by the Marconi radio sets of the time. And his replica is quite close to it, but I was surprised that it wasn't really exactly the same. In the background here, you can see the genuine Marconi key. And notice the very clear curvature of the lever as it goes down to the knob. And in Phil's replica, uh, the lever doesn't curve, it just steps down at an angle and over to the knob. So that is perhaps the most obvious difference between his key and the original. The, uh, the um, binding posts are very similar. And the other really big difference between the original 425 and the fake 425 is the name tag. If we look at the name tags, we see on the top we have an original 425 in which uh, although the the uh, lettering is a little bit worn here. You can see how the, the serial number and the 
specifications, voltage, and so on were stamped into this. And uh, in Phil's replica name tag, you can, first of all, you can see how his um, grinding machine, his uh, lettering machine, sort of left little rough edges in the letters. And you can also see that he really messed up stamping numbers into the machine, into the plate. So it wasn't really a great replica, but uh, it was pretty effective. And a lot of people, tremendous number of people, bought these keys. Typically, uh, when Phil was selling them, he would sell them for about $750. Um, I know people who paid $5,000 for them and then been very, very upset to see that they were fakes. Phil also loved to put them on uh, presentation pieces like this. He decided that he would take one of his fake keys and put it on a fake presentation piece. And uh, if you read the, the writing on this, presented to Ludwig Arnson on December 7th, 1953 by his associates in radio receptor, in commemoration of 50 years devoted to the radio and electronics industry since he sent the first CQD wireless signal on December 7th, 1903. I don't think you can even find a Ludwig Arnson anywhere in history, but Phil made him up. And a very, very well-known spark key collector paid, I believe it was $7,000 for this replica. And uh, when he found out it was a replica, he just simply uh, laughed it off. He said, well, I sure got taken on that one, didn't I, Tom? <laughs> and uh, he was good about it. But Phil always kept a loaded Luger pistol under the cushion in the sofa in his uh, living room, just in case he had to dissuade somebody from uh, doing him in for his uh, taking advantage of them. Uh, here's a picture of the um, Marconi grasshopper key, very, very, very rare key. The originals would be selling in the price range around uh, twenty thousand dollars. And I, I don't actually know. I believe this is an original key. I don't know. I've never actually seen one of Phil's um, replicas of this, but um, uh, it's a beautiful key and very historic. It was the first key that was ever used on a wireless transmitter. And uh, when you push down the knob of the key on the right, it uh, makes the circuit on the right and breaks the circuit on the left, breaking the, the connection to the receiver. Uh, here's a very funny one. Uh, Phil decided he was gonna really hoodwink telegraph key collectors. And so he took this incredibly common little telegraph key and he mounted it in a box and he started engraving very impressive things on the box the order number, the serial number uh, on the end of the box. He said, uh, called it an airplane hand key SE-59. Military World War I um, telegraph sets were put in airplanes and the hand keys that were used in those airplanes were extremely valuable and sought after by people. And uh, on the other side of the key, he uh, wrote the word Signal Corps U.S. Army. But if you look carefully at the spelling of Signal Corps, it's S-I-G-N-E-L, and it should have been S-I-G-N-A-L. Nevertheless, he managed to sell this key for about $1,000. And if you look at its origin, it actually came inside a World War I, very common World War I field buzzer set. And if you open the cover of this set, you can see this very key down in here. And these sets were selling for about 15 or $20 when Phil would just simply take the keys out of them and make them into a priceless uh, World War I airplane spark key. Uh, very clever about that. Um, here is his crowning joy, I think. This is the funniest thing of all the things that I've ever seen him do. This key that we're looking at up here is a Japanese post-war Japanese key that was sold by Lafayette Radio and Radio Shack Corporation for maybe five or ten dollars. It's a semi-automatic key. And what did Phil do? He put a brass label on it that says a semi-automatic key. He put a model number on it and he engraved uh, the Marconi International Marine Communications Company Limited London label on the key, essentially claiming <laughs> that this piece of Japanese junk 
was a Marconi International Marine uh, Telegraph Key. So that was really one of his uh, most amusing and funniest uh, uh, spoofs, I think. And people bought that key. I, I don't know how many made, but I do know one telegraph key collector who bought it just because it was so funny. And he figured, what the heck, I'm going to pay him a couple of thousand dollars for this key. But it's funny enough, I'll get a good laugh out of a lot of other two uh, key collectors, even if I spend that much money. And finally, we end up with uh, a station wagon load of stuff from Phil's uh, laboratory and Phil's house after he died. I came across this pile of stuff at a flea market in New Jersey, and I bought a lot of the labels and a lot of the things that you saw in this talk from this man. He had uh, really cleaned out that laboratory and uh, it was really fun to go through these things and see Phil's work and enjoy the story of Phil Weingart. So with that, I'm going to stop at this point and I hope that you have enjoyed hearing about Phil Weingarten. I'm going to stop the recording here if I can and uh, I'll go back to, uh, it's not working very well. Uh, Let's see, I may be able to do it. No, hold on a moment while I stop the recording. There it is.